here and uh, I'm starting the recording so we have that for future but thank you again for joining us for uh, GEW day two and uh, today's workshop um, this one right here is going to be testing business ideas led by David Bland uh, co-author of testing business ideas and founder and CEO of Precoil but before we hand it over to him to take you through the workshop I just wanted to introduce you to uh, myself in the Carlson Center. So my name is Cameron Law and I serve as the executive director of the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And I'm also the organizer here for the Sacramento Global Entrepreneurship Week. And we're really excited about all that we have here to offer. Um, I'm joined by Arlene Miranda, who's on our team. She provides administrative and marketing support for the Carlson Center. And then Brian Gladden, who's one of our entrepreneurs and residents who helps deliver our programs and serving entrepreneurs as well. And uh, here at the Carlson Center, we serve as a regional hub and platform for, for providing approachable and accessible entrepreneurial education, community, and support to enable startup founders of all backgrounds to explore and launch their businesses. And we're on this mission to make innovation and entrepreneurship pervasive throughout the greater Sacramento region, really, really trying to realize this vision of the uh, Sacramento region being a premier hub of innovation and entrepreneurship. And Global Entrepreneurship Week falls under our Discover sets of programs. Um, so you're actually joining an international celebration. So over 180 countries around the world are celebrating Global Entrepreneurship Week. And we're excited to have this workshop uh, with David Bland on testing business ideas as part of that. And uh, we uh, have been uh, tapping into some of uh, the, the book's offerings in our toolkit series. So Brian leads our toolkit series. So if you've been attending that, you've maybe seen some of this at a high level and keeping uh, giving you some of those tools. But we're looking forward to diving deeper with David here on some of these tools and frameworks for you to be able to apply towards your business. And so before I hand it over to, to David, uh, there will be an interactive component. So we really want you to get engaged and uh, um, start testing out some of the tools that he'll be uh, working through. And if you have any questions, feel free to use the chat feature. I'll help bring them in uh, as we're going and uh, we'll get started with that. So um, I want to uh, introduce uh, David Bland. He is the, as I shared, the co-author of Testing Business Ideas, as well as the CEO and founder of Precoil. David helps build uh, or helps people test business ideas. David pioneered the GE Fastworks with Eric, Eric Reese, uh, coached emerging product teams at Adobe, and even helped Toyota apply lean startup practices. Before his transition into consulting, David spent over 10 years of his career at technology startups. He stays connected to the startup scene through his work at several Silicon Valley accelerators and obviously here today in the Sacramento region through our testing business ideas workshop. So we're really excited to have all of you here in the space and uh, you're gonna be in good hands for the next hour with David. So I'll turn it on over to you and we'll get started with the workshop. Thank you, thank you. Thank you for inviting me back. Uh, I had a blast doing this last year. So it was great uh, to help out again. So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be using Mural. So it's a, it's a free tool that I use uh, when we do the, the actual interactive exercise today. I'll post a link in chat and you can click it and you don't have to create an account or anything. You can just kind of jump right in into the browser window and, and work together with me. So uh, I'll post that in chat in a bit. But for now, I just kind of wanted to, to just talk a little bit about myself. You know, again, I think the intro covered most of it. Um, based out here in Northern California, out in the Sacramento region now. I've uh, been in technology startups uh, for the first like 10 or 11 years of my career. Uh, fintech, defense, analytics, all kinds of stuff. Uh, mostly B2B. And then when I switched to help companies, you know, I, I had to learn how, okay, how would I introduce these kind of concepts to other companies? You know, I was a really big fan of Lean Startup early on and Agile and design thinking. And I felt like those are very complementary. So it kind of just informed my thinking a bit. And the first startup I joined, you know, we thought we were um, a B2C company and we ended up being B2B. <laughs> so that was a huge pivot uh, early on in my career. And I think that really influenced a lot of my thinking. Um, the book has been out for about two years. It's in 20 different languages now. It's, I'm pretty excited about that. And um, it just got, it just got translated into Mongolian. <laughs> so I'm getting a copy of it in Mongolian, uh, which is super cool. <laughs> Never thought I'd ever write a book that was translated in so many uh, languages. So it's been fun. It's again, uh, came out in 2019. It's, it's pretty much a library of uh, experiments. So I wrote it like I, I coach teams. So basically everything you get in there would be similar, you know, if I was like coaching you through an accelerator or even, you know, a session like this today. Um, so the learning goal for us today is pretty much just to help you 
de-risk your business and product ideas. That's the thing that I want to help you with. I know as an entrepreneur and as a founder, like late, late at night, that's what I worry about. You know, did I do the most meaningful stuff today? Um, are there things I'm neglecting that will kill this new thing? And, and usually where I focus is, you know, from idea to product market fit. I've helped scale companies before, but I, I think I, I find more enjoyment in the, uh, the early stage of testing the ideas and applying some kind of rigor and, and control to the process. So um, hopefully today you come out with some, you know, new ways of looking at risk and new ways of kind of uh, approaching it. I do have a code of conduct for everything that I do. Uh, pretty much this is the Bill and Ted code of conduct, which is be excellent to one another. So please, when we share out at the end, be respectful in tone and in and, uh, and words and just, I'm not too worried about this group, but I just want to throw that out there that I do want people to be respectful. And this is, you know, a, a pretty uh, safe space that we're having here today for this hour. Okay. So where I want to kind of focus on is uh, what really, and maybe I can draw for you all a bit here too. So what really kind of drew me, so I went to school for design and, um, you know, I got kind of thrust into the technology world and it, it was really eye opening to me that we, we focused almost all of our efforts on this idea of feasibility, you know, can we do this thing? And so all the tech startups I worked at, it was, oh, can we build this platform or can we build this analytics engine? or you build this algorithm and you know, you, you can build almost anything now. Right. But then we ran into other challenges. We ran into feasibility challenges with, let's say, uh, regulatory bodies. <laughs> so for example, the first, uh, startup I joined was FinTech and we built a platform for transferring, uh, money and financial products online. And, uh, but by the time I left, we were doing about a billion dollars a month in premiums online. And, uh, but early days, like we couldn't even transfer the money. We had to really clear the money through DTCC. We had to work with a cord on developing a standard and everything. And so if we hadn't done that regulatory stuff, right, even though it was feasible, technically it, it would have failed in other ways because we hit up against regulatory bodies. It, it's the same today, you know, when I'm working with, let's say health tech, just because you connect something to the internet in, let's say a hospital. Well, if you violate HIPAA compliance, it's going to get shut. You, know, you can't do that, right? And so there are a lot of these things that when we focus on feasibility, this idea of can we do this? Yes, it's tech, but it's also legal. It's regulatory. It's governance. Like be thinking beyond just tech. You know, one of the startups, I judge at a startup competition um, at BYU. And, you know, in the past, and one of the startups that came through there, you know, they needed FDA approval. For, for their thing. And they're like, Oh, geez, that's six figures. <laughs> like, how are we going to do this as a startup? Right. And so there are all these things, um, they were able to address it, but you, there's all these things that come up now with viability. Um, when you think about viable, is it viable? Should we be doing this? Yes. You need, um, a moral compass in business. And I'm a strong believer in that. Um, I was just interviewed about ethics by like some kind of French magazine, um, recently over the summer. And I was talking a lot about ethics and experimentation and everything. And obviously you want to have ethics and you want to have a strong moral compass when you're developing your business. In addition to that, you also want it to be financially viable. So should we do this in a sense of, I mean, does this make sense from a cost and revenue point of view? Can we generate enough revenue and keep costs low or eventually trend that direction? And I think we have to be very, very careful about this in the startup community because we've seen some artificially viable companies scaled up over the last five to 10 years. And I'm not going to name and shame companies, but essentially they never really had a viable business model, but they were propped up by VC money over the years and it seemed viable. And now they're no longer VC subsidized. It's like, wow, why is this so expensive now? <laughs> it's because it never really had a working business model. <laughs> you know, it was a lot of like gig economy stuff. And, and granted, I am all for giving people flexibility in, in their employment and everything in their careers and their jobs. But in addition to that, it has to be a viable model. And so a lot of my work early on now is, is kind of helping founders understand like, what is the business model? And I'll, and I'll share the tool I use in a minute, but like, what, what is the business model here? Because we need to th like, is this a viable thing that we're about to do? And we can't just raise endless rounds of VC money and, and have that prop up you know, our, our thing, you know, it, unfortunately like, you get the situation where it's like, you put all your competitors who had like they were really trying to use viable models out of business <laughs> because you just kept getting funding <laughs> and then you're the only one left and you never had a model. It's, it's kind of, kind of crazy the world we live in right now. So I'm a big believer in it. Is it, is it viable? 
And then desirability. So basically, is there any customer need here, job to be done? Do you have fit with your value proposition and your, um, your customer segment, you know, the jobs, pains and gains that they have kind of this idea of, do they want this? Is it desirable? That's also, um, a type of risk that, that you have. And so when you neglect one of these, it doesn't usually end well. So for example, when we talk about desirability, let's say we just address desirability. Oops, I was offline for a second. Desirability and viability, but we didn't address feasibility. So people wanted it. There was a business model there. It looked viable, but we couldn't actually build it. <laughs> now that happens. That happens a lot on Kickstarters, on Indiegogo, anything crowdfunding. You'll notice there'll be these moments where you're like, I just want to throw money at this startup because I love this explainer video, love what they're trying to do. And then they realize, oh, I have to source stuff from China. We don't know how to do the firmware. Uh, all this is expensive. We have to like, it won't feasibly work for like a physics point of view. <laughs> and then it, it fails. And you always know because you get these like update found, like, update from the Kickstarter campaign of, oh, uh, we were sick last week, so no progress. <laughs> and then it's like six months later, and he's like, here's your t-shirt you wanted. And he's like, no, I just want the product, right? Um, and that happens. And so you have to take in feasibility. And so when I look at Kickstarter, I love Kickstarter Indiegogo. I love that, that, that type of experiment. And I view those very much as experiments. However, they only test desirability and viability. They do not test feasibility. And they actually only test some of viability because they don't test your cost structure. They don't test some of that backstage stuff. It'll test the demand where people are willing to pay a certain price point, but they're also early adopters and willing to take a risk on you. So, so just, just think of that when you're thinking of your framing of, okay, are we covering all our bases? Now let's say you cover desirability and feasibility, but not viability. Well, that's usually a product everybody loves that is no longer around. And I did this keynote kind of pre pandemic in San Francisco for like thousands of people. And I asked them like, what was a product? that they love that's no longer around. And everybody can think of that product. You know, those little flip cameras that everyone, I mean, I'm dating myself a bit, but it's a flip camera and you plug in USB. Um, people were bringing up like Doritos 3Ds. <laughs> like, the, uh, I guess they're still around or they're coming back, but everyone was like Doritos 3Ds, Doritos. And like Pepsi Clear, all kinds of stuff, like Clearly Canadian, all, all, like software, uh, Google Reader came up, ICQ. Like it was, it was all this list of stuff I could point to. And they're like, I love, love, love that thing, but it's no longer around. They're usually no longer around because they weren't viable. For some reason, they didn't line to the strategy of the company where it was going, or they just couldn't generate enough revenue. I did a talk on Clearly Canadian. It's a pretty funny, like 90s talk about the, the drink. But basically, they had to bring that back, funny enough, as a crowdfunding campaign to try to get it going again. But just think about, you know, if it's not viable, that's a challenge too. And then if you focus on, and far too often we do this, feasibility and viability, and you forget about desirability, then usually what happens, you build something nobody wants. And I've done that at startups. I'm not proud of it. Um, I work nights and weekends trying to get something out there that I thought was amazing and the customers just did not want it. And it's a really painful place to be in because I think pretty much all of us wanted to create things of value that create value. But when you work so hard on something that people just do not want, it doesn't solve a meaningful need. It doesn't solve um, a problem they're looking for. It doesn't create a gain they're looking for then unfortunately it doesn't, it doesn't end up working out well. So ideally, right, you, you kind of want to cover all three. You want to say, okay, what's our risk around desirability and viability and feasibility? And, and basically this, do they want this? Should we do this? Can we do this? Comes up time and time again, no matter what industry I'm working with. You know, I had like a group of blockchain startups come through at an accelerator in Silicon Valley and sure enough, there's a lot of like feasibility and viability concerns. And, and so it didn't matter if it's that or it's automotive or it software as a service or consumer packaged goods. I feel like these three themes add up and, and they always apply. So what we've been doing is we've been layering these over on some of the tools we've created. So, you know, my co-author created this tool called the business model canvas. You've probably all either seen or heard or read about it. And what we've done is we started looking at something like this and saying, okay, what is the, what is a way we can help people focus and talk about risk with regards to their strategy? And so basically, if you look at desirability, is it desirable? It's a lot of the top right, your value proposition and your customer segments. If you look at viability and is it viable, that's a lot of the bottom boxes. So cost and revenue. And then if you look at feasibility, it's all your backstage. So it's like your activities and your resources and, and your partners. So it's not perfect, but I feel like it's a pretty good 
lens or like a filter to put on top of your strategy and say, okay, what is it that is, is riskier for us, right? At this point in our journey. And, and a lot of it's a series of guesses and that's okay early on, but you need to kind of drive out some of the ambiguity of your business model as you, you know, grow your startup. And I know a lot of people are gonna say, well, they're asking me to write a business plan and I need to do a five year projection in Excel. And I'm not completely against doing that, but I strongly recommend that you understand the model before you create the plan. So I think there's some value in creating that plan, but if you don't understand the model, it's pretty much just like creative writing, it's creative fiction and no one's gonna read it and the VC is kind of kind of like, okay, well you did the plan, but you really need to be able to tell a story about the model and understand the model and understand the risks about the model. And so usually when I'm working with, with companies, it's like, okay, who are your customer segments? Please like behavioral, psychographic market, like what, who are you focused on serving? And then what is your value prop to them? Now with this, it could be your product, but most of the time I'm saying like, what's the value of using your product? Not necessarily just your product, not just the algorithm, not just the platform, not just the app, but what is the value that you're offering through that? And then what channels are you using? Uh, distribution, acquisition to get to your customers. What type of relationship do you have with your customers? So quite often that's like, is it automated? Is it in person? Is it ongoing? Is it one time? Like what's the nature of the relationship? And then uh, what are your revenue streams? How are you generating revenue? It doesn't really have to be direct. It can be indirect, you know, like if I mapped out Google here, we all use Google, we're searching, generating search. Um, I feel like Google is like the biggest wizard of Oz in the world <laughs> in a way, or concierge, because we're all generating it, right? We're all like doing the searches. And then advertisers pay Google to get in front of them, right? And so this is how this, is how this happens. And then um, what are your um, activities? So think about like, key activities. So with regards to, um, <laughs> with regards to your, um, verbs. So think of the key verbs you're going to be doing. And then what are your uh, nouns? So think about the physical and digital nouns and then cost structure. So how do you essentially, uh, what is this cost? And then key partners. So what are the key partners for, um, making this work? And so when you think about it, you partner with somebody because they provide, uh, they provide an activity or a resource, or they create a channel for this to work. And then essentially you look at your costs and you say, okay, this is from basically my um, activities and resources will add up to my costs. And then this is how I deliver my value to my customers. And this is how we generate revenue. So you can start looking at it as kind of like a flow. And I like this much better than um, essentially doing <laughs> other things, right? Um, I look at it as a flow, it's like, here's our one page strategy document. Okay, so uh, what we do is we kind of, you know, if you back up a bit, you could start looking and you say, oh, all right, we have these themes and we have this, uh, this canvas and we have some, some like flow to it. We understand how things relate. So what do we start doing? Well, we start basically end up creating and writing down some of our assumptions to that. And then from there, we end up mapping them. Okay. So I like using, we believe I like using colors. So kind of these beliefs of we believe, and then we kind of write down what are the big assumptions around our value prop, our segments, our channels, our relationships, what are our viability? I like green for viability. So what are our um, assumptions around cost and revenue? And then basically with um, feasibility is a lot of blue. So around kind of like our activities and our resources and our partners. And so kind of what happens here, so I'm working with founders and they're, they're working with your advisors or your co-founders, you know, you start pulling these over and say, how important is this for us to succeed? And then how much evidence do we have to support this statement? And this is one of the reasons I like them as statements and not questions is there, it's like a belief and assumption you're making. And then how much evidence qualitative and quantitative, uh, recent evidence that basically supports that statement. And so what happens is when you start mapping these over, you end up with this interesting kind of view uh, early on about the risk of your, your startup and your company. And so um, I can't always predict what, what it'll look like. I've done hundreds of these or maybe thousands at this point. <laughs> so um, I have uh, some ideas of what it could look like, but pretty much it, it's like this facilitated structured conversation that gets you to this point where you can say, okay, 
what is what's this collection of things like what, what are these things that are most important that we have the least amount of evidence about and so if you read like lean startup and followed eric Ries' work you know he would call this like a leap of faith assumption it's pretty similar to that i'm looking for the things that have to be true that you have almost no evidence to support and so um i i have a little name for this i call it um, assumptions mapping and basically uh, Google uses this and a bunch of companies use this now. Um, sorry, it's a little laggy there. Um, but basically, <laughs> it's nice. I just left that lag there, of course. Um, let me see what happened to my, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> okay, we'll try that again. It didn't, it didn't come through. Anyway, uh, my point is the joys of technology. My point is, um, it's called uh, assumptions mapping. I'll t I'll type it this time. <laughs> let's let's do that. I've never heard that happen before. It's funny. Um, it's called assumptions mapping. And basically, um, what this is is it's just like a tool. It's like a two by two that people use to figure out. All right, are we are we focused on the things where we can experiment on? And and so that's tough. You know, sometimes it'll be fun. I work with a lot of technical founders. And, and a lot of the um, experiments and stuff they want to do is around um, it's around feasibility, right? It's like, oh, can I build this bot or I can can I build this algorithm? And, and they spend so much time on it, but they don't they neglect the did anybody really need this or does anybody care? Is there a use for this? And, and that's usually where things end up uh, falling apart. And so what we do is after we we map these out, basically what we do is we just start essentially running experiments off of kind of this um, top right. And we try to pick experiments that will help us learn about that risk. And so in the book, um, we have 44 different experiments. And so, you know, it's not perfect, but what we try to do is kind of build off of Steve Blank's work with Four Steps of Epiphany and Eric Ries's work and just everything I've seen, you know, coaching teams and, and working in this world for about 10 years now. And we, we've kind of, um, we ended up organizing these around discovery and validation. And so we're talking about overall discovery and um, overall validation. So for example, you know, for like, you just have an idea, let's say today, and you're like, okay, wh where do I even begin with this? Well, from an evidence point of view, you know, you're going from none to some. So you're trying to figure out, is there any evidence whatsoever that customers have these jobs to be done, that they experience these pains, that they're looking for these gains. And in that, essentially, you know, you might do some interviews, you might do some search trend analysis, you might um, do, you know, some facilitated exercises with people. And basically, there's all these things you can do uh, day in the life, which is more ethnographic research and observational. There's all this stuff you can do to figure out, okay, do we have basically any evidence whatsoever <laughs> that we're on the right track? And when we go to validation, you're really trying to go from some, oops, one second. You're trying to go from some to strong. So with validation, you're, you're trying to get to, is there strong evidence here that we are, um, we're really kind of, there's a value exchange. We, we can, we can do something that people pay for that there's really value. It's not just, a landing page with a call to action and we're farming emails, right? Which is great, but that's pretty light evidence. We're actually delivering something to people. And in doing that, essentially what you're, what you're seeing is you have, um, you know, concierge experiments where people kind of do it all manually. So I think about, you know, these like white glove, small scale things that people do to deliver value instead of building the whole thing. So, you know, travel can be like this sometimes where people are booking travel and you're doing it through a person versus like a bot yet. It's not a bot yet. It's like, I'm just a person helping you do it. Um, some of my, you know, chat experiences and like people are just will manually do it. Uh, I laugh sometimes that like, I talk to like vending machine startups and people and they go, what if you just put a person in the store with a table and try to sell stuff? <laughs> I'm like, okay, <laughs> yeah, that's concierge. Now you have to be careful because obviously the way people interact with a person is going to be a little different than the machine, but that is one way, right? You can test. And then with regards to Wizard of Oz, it's similar to that, except basically it's not obvious a person is involved. So a lot of these like um, AI startups I work with, 
they're mostly spreadsheets behind the scenes and people. They don't really have a lot of AI yet. So they're using kind of that to deliver value to people. A single feature MVP is one that jumps out here. I would say Amazon dash buttons are a great example of that. You know, there's little physical dash buttons they had where you put it on your computer or not your computer, but you'd put it on like your refrigerator or on your washing machine and you'd press a button and it would order you, let's say, um, detergent for your, your washing machine. What Amazon was doing there, there is they were testing their way from screen purchase experience and they were really testing their Alexa strategy. And, but they were doing it with these like little single features. And so you really can't get those buttons anymore, but now your washing machine talks to Alexa and can like order stuff for you or your refrigerator can. And so they were sort of um, trying to test their way. I feel like Amazon's really good at that. They, they are very quantitative. Um, they, they have a lot of uh, really basic things they'll test instead of getting a really big vision, but they'll break it down into really small tests. And then, and then mashups, which, which I think a lot of this no code movement is really um, taking off on this, this no code stuff uh, as far like, it's really interesting. I had a Zapier come to my, my um, masterclass in December, last December. And we just you know, had a webinar with them over the summer and they are it's like Zapier is using these techniques to test even what they do. And a lot of their stuff is no code, right? So I want um, my, uh, harvest account to do something with like QuickBooks to do something with something else and balance stuff. Like you can, you can like wire together stuff in a ways you almost would have to write custom code for in the past. And so now everything, you know, these APIs and everything. And so this mashup, this idea of you can mash up things to deliver value is really, really strong. And so, um, I'm seeing a lot of companies instead of building, they'll do something like on bubble, which is like a no code platform and it'll give them a one to two years. Of, of growth before they probably have to build that thing in, in a different way. But one to two years is a long time. I, I wouldn't have dreamt that, you know, uh, that that would last that long and could be like an actual viable thing that would work. And people have re recreated uh, Airbnb on that platform. They've recreated Uber Eats. It's a pretty amazing. Now there is a learning curve. Um, I was in a, I was in a Twitter space, I think it was like last week. And I was talking to a lawyer who she quit. She did not know how to code at all. And she left her job. And she learned Bubble, and within a month, she had launched a platform on Bubble and was earning money through it. And so, even if you don't have any software experience, like yes, there's a learning curve to it, but there's so much you can do now without having to have to have like years and years of software experience. So, which is really really fascinating. So, these are just a few um, from from that kind of collection. So, uh, what I want to do is kind of dive into a bit to how I think about these, and then we can um, do a little exercise together. So with something like concierge, basically, you know, if you look at the taxonomy we've applied to these, granted, there's many more than 44 experiments, but we had to draw the line somewhere. I <laughs> like the book's almost 400 pages. So um, I think it's like 200 pages of experiments. Um, so it takes up a lot of the book. But basically, this idea of um, how do you think about them? And so a concierge, right, is, is more of like this, um, you're doing it manually, you know, it doesn't scale, but you're, there's a real value exchange. And so behind the scenes, so behind the scenes, basically, you're testing uh, feasibility, okay? Because you're essentially saying, okay, can we do this from a feasible point of view, or right? can we execute on the creating this thing? You can test desirability, right, with this interaction with the customer, and you're also because they're paying, right? You're testing viability as well. And, and so what happens is, you know, the way we tag this in the, in the library, is kind of like you have, like this can work for desirability and feasibility and viability. So you can test um, all these, all these themes and it ends up kind of generating a lot of, of strong evidence, right? Because even as a small scale, you should be able to use this to inform what you would build. So I think it's just really fascinating way to you know, you kind of test something out as small and it doesn't scale and it's okay. It's okay to do things that don't scale early on. Um, I feel like the will it scale question <laughs> is such a, uh, that question really is really hard for me early on because it's like, there's so many other meaningful things you'd be talking about, rather it, it could scale yet. You're really just trying to figure out, am I solving a meaningful issue, like problem for people? Will you pay for it? And can I actually do a thing that will solve? <laughs> like, like, don't worry about scale right away. Um, now, what I also love about this is the cost is low. And so the cost here, because you're doing it manually, there's not a lot of like tech costs or uh, all this out, like stuff you have to buy. Like it's basically you doing it manually. The setup time doesn't take too long. It, you know, you have to plan out the steps and you have to obviously 
um, you know, create create the uh, the time to do it, but it, it's not doesn't take long to set up. And then you usually don't run it for very long, you know, depending on how much data you need to generate. If you're doing something manually, you know, it's usually a week or a few days. Like it's not a ton of time to, to generate um, the evidence you need. And you know, also I, I kind of throw in the capabilities when I'm doing these, which is more of who who might or what capabilities you might need to have to pull this off. You know, design, product, technology, legal, marketing. I, I point on legal just because sometimes we're doing stuff where it's probably good to consult legal before we jump in. Um, I make this joke that like sometimes startups have to be a little bit illegal, but don't be like too much illegal. <laughs> too much illegal is usually not a good thing, but a little bit illegal. But you, you have to kind of get, um, you have to get some advice and counsel before you just do stuff, right? So we're not necessarily recommending like you defraud people or anything like that. You just have to like, if you're even doing something in consumer packaged goods, you know, you have to, you might, might have to check in with safety and compliance or, you know, it has to meet certain rules and regulations to do it. So something I just want to stress, um, don't just go out and, and like do, do the research and, and invite the right people or have the capabilities in the room to pull this off. Now, when uh, we look at evidence in this regard, and I think this gets overlooked a bit, the way we kind of frame it is, and the way I frame it in the book, is more strong and weak. But, you know, I really kind of updated based on Alex's, um, Alex Osterwalder, um, my co-author, we, we've um, kind of adapted our, our language over the last year or so to be more like strong and light evidence. And so I like that framing a bit better. It doesn't mean you're doing a bunch of work and it's just weak. You know, there's some negative connotations I'm noticing when I'm having these conversations. I think light is working a bit better. So we may update the book to reflect that eventually. But basically what you're trying to do is move from like what people say to what they do. And that is going from kind of lighter evidence to stronger evidence. So what people say is great, but it but it's there's a say do gap here. It's kind of like a spouse theory, theory in action. Like what people do, it's like, yeah, I want to go to the gym, but then <laughs> don't go to the gym. <laughs> it's like we always have these things. So, you know, it's great to interview people, but you do want to move to what what they actually do. Another thing is if you look at opinions, you're, you're trying to move closer to facts. So, so basically you want to move from just opinions about things to like, what are, what are the observable facts? What's the observable evidence around the facts around these situations? And then you kind of want to move from, let's say what I would call a lab setting to more um, real world. And so like, like, let's say you invited people in and they know what's a big test and they're certainly very biased about that. I think this is one of the challenges I have with focus groups. Everyone's like, let's run our focus group. Well, yeah, but you're biasing people in a lab setting and there's kind of group think and stuff. And, and so there's, you gotta be really careful with that. So I'm usually trying to push people to what, what's happening in the real world. Like what can we test with in the real world? And then one, I think we, we kind of get confused about is if we think about, um, investment. So let's say low investment versus, um, high investment right? A low investment on, on the customer side here, not, the, not how expensive it is to run the experiment. When you think about an investment, right? A low investment, well, let's say, oh, I'm going to give up my email for this. Like I'm a customer and I'm giving up my email versus, you know, I'm prepaying, right? And so when you think about, um, uh, you think about like landing pages, for example, right? I think Buffer is a great example of this, you know, early days Buffer, they had um, just a plans and pricing link, and they say, we're not ready yet, put in your email, right? And so that was pretty low investment on the customer side. Then they went back and they added like pricing tiers. And they said, okay, and they, 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 they tracked who clicked which pricing tier and then give up their email. And they gradually made it to a way where people were paying for it. And so just be careful that, you know, if you do something, you have a call to action with an email, and let's say a thousand people sign up. Well, that doesn't mean a thousand people are going to buy your thing. Um, quite often you don't know why they signed up. You just know that they signed up, you know, the what, but not the why. And so being able to reach out to them and say, and, and ask, you know, okay, can I talk to you about why you signed up or, um, anything to just get like build a connection with them and try to understand because I've seen startups that say like collect a thousand emails, go build for six months, go back to that list. And people are like, I don't even remember why I signed up. Like, I don't even, who are you? <laughs> that's not, and that's not great. If you've, you have your Excel spreadsheet and you're like, oh, we get 50% of these to pay. And then there's like five to pay. So I think just be careful of the investment on the customer side. And that what you really want to do is you kind of want to move to what people do 
with facts in the real world with a higher investment over time. And you don't get there right away. It takes time to get there, but you, you want to move from open-ended. Do we have any evidence whatsoever? People want this to eventually people are paying for this and using it and, and, and whatnot. But um, I like this framing of evidence because I think sometimes we, we kind of get it mixed up, you know, we'll have signups and then we just think that's great, but it's really in the, in the grand scheme of things, we shouldn't be super confident because just because people were willing to give up their email. And so I've been liking this process much more like social sciences recently over the last couple of years, because when you think of social sciences, you can think of confidence and behavior. And so in, in startups and in, in new products and new businesses, you really, you want to calibrate your confidence. Like how confident should I be about this thing? And I know entrepreneurs are somewhat endearing. You have this like reality distortion field around you and everyone's like, People told Steve Jobs he was wrong, and I get it, I get it. And Elon Musk, people told him was wrong. But what you want to do is you shouldn't be really confident if you've only talked to like five customers. And you shouldn't be confident enough to go spend months building a thing to go back to those five customers, right? There are all these things that you can do in, the, in between. And so just try to calibrate your confidence a bit when you're working on new stuff in that what kind of evidence is this thing I'm working on? What is it generating? And how confident should I be in that? And I have to say, interviews, surveys, pretty light evidence. You know, people answer a lot of weird things on surveys and a lot of things that they'll never do. People tell you in interview stuff they'll, they'll never really do. And especially a future hypothetical situation. So, oh, I would buy that in the future for blah, blah, blah. And, and, and what you really need to do instead is anchor in the past and go, have you experienced something in the past that was similar to this? How did you solve it or not solve it? And what did you do and how much money did you spend? And there's all kinds of stuff that you can do to get a little better evidence about the facts and what happened. So what I've done um, is I created this kind of cheat sheet for you all. So I'll put this link in chat. Where did my chat go? There's chat. All right. So I'm going to give you this link. And basically, uh, you don't have to create an account. You'll come in as like anonymous squirrel or something. Um, but what I've done is I've created a little space here where, um, I have a card, like the cards from the book, they don't go as deep, but I think it might be helpful for you all. So for example, if you were, I don't know, let's say you were worried, you're like, Hmm, I don't know what this uh, day in the life is. Well, if you double click on that, it'll kind of open the PDF. And if I, you know, kind of scroll in here, one, if I scroll in here, basically it's going to say, oh, this is like ethnographic research. It doesn't, it costs a little bit. The evidence strength is kind of in the middle because we're observing, but we're not necessarily um, doing, you know, it's, it's just kind of observational. So for example, if I'm, um, what's a good one we did recently? Oh, connected cranes. So there's a company that wanted to connect cranes that load um, shipping containers off docks, which is a giant constraint right now. It's a big cluster like around the U.S. Um, that uh, if we connected cranes that could offload stuff automatically, then it wouldn't have like the downtime of, let's say, someone sitting up in there and not doing something, or they had to go to the restroom, or there was an accident, or you, you could literally track the amount of time they go up and down the crane to get in and out. There's all kinds of stuff you could do. But what they were doing there, they were just observing, right? They didn't like buy, the, they didn't build the whole thing to connect all the cranes yet. It was more like, well, what could we? observe here that would help inform our value proposition and our solution. So it's more just like observational. It just tests desirability because you're observing. It doesn't kind of test if, if you can build it or if people pay for it. But um, basically what I've done is I've um, essentially put like the discovery ones in here. So you have all the discovery experiments and then you have the um, validation experiments. So what I thought might be fun if you're up for it is um, let's do like an experiment sequence, you know? So basically if you just double click, it'll create a sticky. And so let's say um, if I'm working on something new with a startup, usually what they'll do is they'll start with customer interviews. So they'll start with interviewing customers about their jobs, pains and gains. Have they ever experienced something like, like this in the past? What was it like? There's a lot of um, kind of qualitative research. And then what they might do after that is they might do something like search um, trend analysis. So they'll go online to like Google Trends and Keyword Planner maybe answer the public and other things and say, are, are people searching for this thing that we heard in these 15 to 20 interviews from that? They might do some paper prototyping where they are sketching out what it potentially could be and, and showing that to early stage people like early stage customers that maybe 
at the end of the interview, there was a call to action. Could we contact you again? They said, yes, I'd love to see what you're working on later. And you can kind of go back to them and say, okay, this is what we're sketching out and getting, getting thoughts. Um, they could also go from that to a clickable prototype. So that's something a little more, less passive. It's a little more interactive where they can click. It doesn't work. Um, things I've seen in the past, I've used pop app for that, where we literally like sketch and take pictures. Um, Figma is pretty good for this. There's a lot of Figma stuff out there now that you can use as a, um, essentially like something that people can click, but there's nothing behind the scenes, but you're trying to get this. It's a very different experience from then just watching a video versus like clicking, right. Or, or interacting in some way. Um, from there you might do like an explainer video, right. And then from there you might throw that onto a landing page. And from there you might do something like a concierge where the people that signed up, um, you know, you have a list now. And so from the concierge list, you could basically say, we're going to do a really small scale, like wait list. And we will do this manually for a few people and to see if there's value in it before trying to scale it. Right. But if you look at kind of the flow there, you know, what you're, what, what I'm trying to convey here is you're going from, Oh, I, what we learned from interviews informed our search trend analysis that helped inform our paper prototype testing to our clickable prototype testing to create an explainer view video that explains like a Dropbox video or Dollar Shave Club or something that explains what we're working on to we put that in a landing page with a value prop and a call to action. And then the people that sign up, you know, we, we take that and we kind of use that as a small scale test. Right. And there are a lot of startups doing this now. I mean, I've, I've spoken to enough <laughs> and enough have had the book now that, um, and they're starting to work through it this way versus we did customer interviews and then we built the app six months later, which is a very expensive way to find out if you're wrong or right. If you're right, you look like a genius. Uh, if you're wrong, it's probably a, not a recoverable event for you. So um, what I thought I would do is for those of you that just click the link, uh, you can you can jump in here. You don't have to create an account or anything. I see some of you already in here. And so um, it's just going to open up a browser window. And it's, it's really easy to create a sticky. You just double click and type. It's kind of like using Keynote or PowerPoint. Or uh, Miro is another product that does this, just a virtual whiteboard. But basically, um, what I want to do is I'm going to set a timer here for, let's do six minutes. And I'm going to give you space to kind of look at the experiments here on the left. Again, there's 44 of them. They have some information about them. And then similar to I did, which is like stickies, if there's something you're working on, you know, start writing out some of the stickies that you feel like, oh, well, that could help me learn more about X. You know, I'm really worried about this kind of thing. And this experiment looks like it might help me with that. All right. Uh, someone's asking, can I download this page? Uh, I'll leave this page up for you. Um, but basically, there's no way for you to export it right now. So give me a thought. Maybe there's a way I can uh, download it to a PDF or something for you all. But there's no like way to download it right now for this session. Okay. So I'm going to put this for five minutes and play some music for you all. So we'll do five minutes because I spent a minute answering questions here. <laughs> so five minutes and then um, we'll, we'll circle back around and answer some questions. All right. And I'll play some music for you. Different music. We'll have different music. So I'll play some. All right. And go.
about two minutes left. About one minute left. Plain seatbelt sound mural. All right, so uh, time is up. And so what I'll do, I'll just kind of uh, keep asking your questions in chat uh, as well. And uh, so what we got here. So we have some things around customer interviews, day in the life. Uh, let me zoom in a bit. Some of the stuff you all created here. Uh, to card sorting, to storyboard, to clickable, to validation survey, to mashup. Yeah, I mean, that flow, what that would do is you would learn things from the interviews, which would inform going off and doing your observational stuff. You know, with observational, um, it, it can be a bit tricky to do because you don't want to bias them when you're observing. But, you know, um, one of the case studies I have in the book is from Intuit, which is a bigger company, been around a while. And, and that's, um, they call it follow me home, which sounds a bit creepier, <laughs> but yeah, they get permission. <laughs> they don't just randomly follow people home. Um, and, and they watch people like install QuickBooks and all that stuff. Um, card sorting is good for sorting information. Sometimes we'll sort like the... Um, jobs, pains, and gains of customers, and then have them blind rank them. There's all kinds of interesting stuff you can do there. Uh, storyboarding, it's usually collaborative storyboarding where we're visually sketching things out. With the clickable, it's something more interactive. The validation survey is, again, another way you could sort. You can have people sort uh, through a survey. And then uh, mashup is usually, you know, is you're not building much, right? You're, you're just wiring stuff together using Zapier or Notion or Airtable or, or whatever it is you use to uh, deliver value. In the hardware world, you know, that could be 3D printing, using existing parts, putting stuff together. Uh, some of the hardware startups, um, I had the pleasure of meeting Tom Chi, who helped create Google, Google Glass. And he was really pushing this to the extreme where he had, it was pretty crazy. He had, it was almost like Shenzhen or something. He had a group of people that would, let's say, doing something with like uh, a phone and they would have customer interviews. And then 30 minutes later, they had another batch of interviews coming in and they had to uh, make the changes to the phone based on the interview. In, in that span of 30 minutes and test it again. <laughs> it was pretty insane. Um, so it depends on you and your, your ability to do that. But there's certainly um, hardware is, um, I don't know, Andreessen has this great quote of like hardware is, is hard. <laughs> uh, I saw his talk in San Francisco a while back and I thought that was funny. But basically hardware is coming along, right? You can 3D print a lot of things, you can mash up stuff. Um, even early Tesla was pretty much a mashup. Like that mule was pretty much a Lotus Elise this was some other stuff mashed together into that, that prototype. So there's a lot you can do. Um, down here we have supplier interviews. So that's really interesting in the backstage. It's basically like vetting your suppliers and your channel partners. And so what we'll do is interviews. We might use a letter of intent there as well. Like the interview sounded great. We signed this non-legally binding one pager to say that you will do X, Y, and Z before you do the 300 page like MSA or agreement or whatever. 
um, discovery survey, search trend analysis. Uh, one of the tools I mentioned was answer the public. It's all one word, answer the public.com. They give you three free queries or they used to three free queries a day. And so you can go in and it makes it kind of more user friendly and they'll visually map out how people are searching based on autocomplete and everything in Google. It's kind of cool. I use it for questions, like what kind of questions people are searching for online. Uh, it's called answer the public. Um, single feature and doing printing and then pre-sailing and pop-up. Yeah, one of the um, case studies I have is Topology Eyewear based out of San Francisco in the book. And they um, scan your face and then they make glasses to fit your face. And they used a pop-up store to validate a lot of that. They would intercept people walking along like Market Street and they would ask them about their glasses and the fit and everything. And then they could just like kind of walk them into their little pop-up store and show them how to use the app. And 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 uh, they actually did some pre-sales. They weren't they weren't really going into it with a goal of pre-sales, but people were so um, enamored with their solution that some people are like, I can, I want to buy this now. <laughs> so pop-up stores are, um, as we come out of this pandemic too, I think are going to be more viable again. So yeah, very cool. Um, before we get to questions, so here in uh, this, people were asking me during kind of DMs in, in chat here, if you just double click this stuff over here at free stuff, that's just going to drop you onto my uh, site that has a bunch of articles I've written and templates I use for like assumptions mapping and experience, experiments and stuff. Or if you're meeting with your advisory board, um, some videos on how to think through this stuff. And then people were asking about tooling and, and apps. And I don't really have an app yet, but um, with here, there, there's a type form here that'll walk you through. It's free. Um, you'll walk you through all the questions I would ask you about your startup. And then it emails you a list. And so like target customers, um, you know, all, all these different things that uh, kind of I hinted at during the talk today. So that's all free. Just double click on this thing as well. So with that, uh, what questions, I guess, um, Cameron or Brian, are there any questions you think we should grab here in the last five minutes we have? Yeah, I'm not sure if you got any uh, private questions, um, but we maybe have time yeah, for one or two questions. Yeah, I'm just kind of scrolling through. Um, equating doing something meaningful with scaling, uh, important to distinguish between the two. Um, however, wouldn't your solution scale quickly if you were actually building something meaningful? Yeah, um, you have to be careful because sometimes uh, the scaling too early, I feel like early days, we would call that being tech crunched, like you'd end up on tech crunch and you'd get a million visitors and you couldn't really deal with the demand. Now it's more like you end up on product hunt or hacker news. But basically, it, it can be um, detrimental because what happens is you get a lot of attention and then you have to sort through that attention to figure out who actually has the problem that I'm trying to solve here or who's really a customer. And it's a lot of noise. So uh, quite often what we do is do wait lists or do things where we try to filter and be very specific and targeted. Ideally, yes, you want to get to a point where you're scaling. But I think early on, I think we overestimate how, how uh, poorly, <laughs> like how, how, the, how much pressure this puts on people to scale too quickly. And I think we've seen that, you know, in some of the apps and everything um, that have kind of come out this year, of like a bunch of attention right away. And it's kind of like, oh, can I just keep it together? Um, so yeah, eventually that is a product, a scaling is a product of solving a meaningful problem at scale, right, for a bunch of people. But you don't necessarily want to artificially generate a lot of scale really early on because usually it just causes more headaches than anything else. Um, I've been on some projects that topped Product Hunt and we had thousands and thousands of visitors that we're just clicking because we taught product hunt. They did not have the problem that we were trying to solve. And so it became a lot of noise, whereas I wish we would have not topped it. <laughs> We'd have kept it smaller and maybe tried to do product hunt later on when we actually had something that people could use. So just be careful of like too much attention too early. So one question come in, uh, is there a book dedicated to B2B customers? Um, I don't know of a specific book. There, there's one I haven't read. I've seen around. It's kind of like lean B2B. I don't know how good it is. But um, what I found is in this book, basically, um, there are specific experiments that are better for B2B. And so um, it, it, let me scroll in here. So, so basically, I mean, this isn't a perfect answer, but, you know, a lot of these down here end up being more B2B, right? So Things like product box, uh, box, speedboat, buy a feature, card sorting. Really what you're trying to break is this um, context of like they just expect you to pitch them and you want to break that framing really early and have more like a facilitated conversation about their real needs. 
And so what happens usually, and I have some sequences in the book around B2B, but usually um, you're doing more preference and prioritization. You're doing more LOIs. So there's certain experiments that are um, more applicable, but I, that's not like I've tagged them that way yet anyway. But um, I have had requests from like pharma companies and stuff to do specific experiment books for them, you know, like a subset. And so who knows, I might pursue that a bit more early or later on, but right now this is more broadly kind of applicable. But yeah, you could try the Lean B2B book. Um, I don't know, I haven't read it, but it seems to be pretty popular. So maybe that'll help. Awesome. Well, I think that question gets us to about time. Um, so wanted to just, as we draw to a close, say thank you, David, for sharing your experience and expertise. We enjoyed having you back for um, this year's Global Entrepreneurship Week and just being a, a thought leader in our, our local uh, community here. And uh, we certainly enjoy using your tools and frameworks to support entrepreneurs through our toolkit series and um, certainly uh, love hearing it from the source as well. So um, you just threw in the chat uh, some of your ways to get contacted and accessing uh, David's uh, services. So feel free to, to reach out there. Um, he did say the mural will be available for a certain period of time and we'll also be sharing the recording. So. Um, this is day two of five, so we hope you join us for uh, a number of other events and activities that are taking place throughout the week for Global Entrepreneurship Week. And we want to say thank you again, David, for coming and joining us and sharing your experience and expertise. And we look forward to seeing you all about the ecosystem for GEW. So thank you all and thank you, David. Thank you, David. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.